Hi everyone and welcome to this week's crime and punishment story. Before we begin, can I just say if you enjoy this story, please give it a thumbs up and if you are new here, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you would like to hear more stories like this one or stories about the history of the North East. And do please feel free to share this video if you think others might enjoy it too. Thank you. Ernest Bernard Scott was found guilty of the murder of his sweetheart Rebecca Quinn and was hanged at Newcastle Prison in 1919. Ernest was hanged on the same day as Ambrose Quinn whose story I have previously covered and I must add that Ambrose Quinn was no relation to Rebecca Quinn. Ernest was the second last man to ever be hanged at Newcastle Prison. This is his story. Ernest was born in around 1893 in the Elswick area of Newcastle to parents William and Annie. He was one of eight children. In 1911, he was an apprentice sugar boiler at a sweet factory. He did not stay in this job though as he was at sea for several years and it would seem that he was twice fined for failing to board his ship, even one time being sent to prison for two months. His most recent job was working in a colliery. Rebecca Jane Quinn, the victim, was born in around 1894 in New Delaval, near Blythe, to parents Patrick and Elizabeth, and she was also one of eight children. Rebecca was not married, but she had a baby, a girl, and the father is unknown, and it was made clear that it was not Ernest Scott. Rebecca had recently started a job in 1919 as housekeeper for two minors at Bebside. Her daughter remained at home with her parents in New Delaville. Ernest had been keep, keeping company, as it was described in those days, with Rebecca for around three weeks, and all seemed to be going well. Most who had seen them together thought they were a happy couple. However, Ernest said that Rebecca had given him up and was now with another man. Whether this was true or not is unknown, but he believed it, and it had certainly been enough to send him into a deep, jealous rage. He spent the night before the crime working out what he called his plan, which he then put into action on Monday, August the 11th, 1919. At around 10am that morning, Ernest called on a lady called Margaret Davison who lived in West Row in Bebside and told her to pass a message on to Rebecca that her baby had been scalded. Margaret went to the home of the miners, two brothers by the name of Smith, where Rebecca worked, also in West Row, and passed the message on. She then returned to her own home. A very short time later, Rebecca came to her house and she was very upset and Margaret said she would walk with her to her home in New Delaval, so they both began to walk along the footpath that at the time ran alongside the North Eastern Railway line. They had not travelled far when they met with Ernest, who was standing on the same footpath, as if he was waiting for them. Ernest asked Rebecca, why have you taken so long to come when you were called for? Rebecca did not reply to this, perhaps because she was too upset to speak, but there's no real reason given for why she did not reply. He then joined the two women on their walk towards New Delaval. It seems for a short while they were all walking side by side, then Margaret walked a little ahead of the couple, and it was at this point that she turned to look back and saw Ernest put his arm around Rebecca's shoulders, and in an instant she saw blood gushing from a wound in Rebecca's neck, and she fell to the ground. Ernest immediately jumped over the fence for the railway and ran across the lines towards Bebside. Margaret immediately ran to her friend's side. She tried to get help. She called out to someone passing and pointed to where Ernest had gone and she stayed with Rebecca but there was little that she could do to help her. Although she had still been breathing when she first fell, this had sadly only been for a few moments. Margaret remained by Rebecca's side until the policeman and later the doctor arrived. It was said that someone chased after Ernest but that he had got away from them and although Ernest was running over the fields he quickly came into contact with a policeman who was in the area on his bicycle. He immediately told him, I have killed a woman, take me away. 
and it was claimed that he also said, if you had not caught me, I was going to finish myself off in the river. Although he no longer had the weapon with him, having thrown it away a short time after attacking Rebecca, there was blood to be seen on his hands and possibly on his clothes, so his confession was taken seriously. He was then taken to the police station at Blythe, and on the way he spoke of his plan to kill Rebecca, how it all seemed to stem from his thoughts that she had another man, and how it had taken him two attempts to cut the throat of the girl he claimed to love. He also told where she could be found. Pacey Callahan said he found Rebecca where Ernest had said she would be. She was lying in a pool of blood and it was clear to him that she was already dead. He could see two wounds to her neck. He managed to follow a trail of blood and was able to find the weapon used by Ernest, which turned out to be a razor. Ernest was then charged with the willful murder of Rebecca Quinn, to which he replied, That is correct. I am happy now. The inquest was held a few days later at the courthouse in Blythe. Here it was revealed that Ernest had given Margaret Davison a letter to the Smith brothers, who Rebecca worked for. Some of what Ernest said in that letter is as followed. I cannot part with my love so easily. There is nothing wrong with the child, but I cannot part with Becky. In death we will be happy. God forgive this rash act. He had signed it with his name, <clears throat> but also with Rebecca's. But it was clear that she had not been a party to this letter, as the handwriting was all Ernest's. Then there was no explanation either as to what he meant about Rebecca's baby. It was also claimed that he had gone to Fred Robson, a barber, though some reports say he was a barman, for the loan of the razor on the morning of the crime. Fred identified the razor shown at the inquest as being his. Dr Gallagher, who had attended to Rebecca, said the wounds to her neck were the obvious cause of her death and that by the time he had arrived at the scene of the crime, she had been dead some 20 minutes and there had been nothing he could do to help her. The jury at the inquest very quickly found Ernest guilty of murder and he was committed for trial. The funeral of Rebecca Quinn took place, I believe, on August the 14th at Cowpen Cemetery. The hearse had left the home of her parents in New Row in New Delaville. The funeral procession passed through Newsham, Blythe and Cowpen Colliery and it was said that all along the route blinds were drawn. It was a private service conducted by the Reverend Curran of Blythe with only the close family in attendance. The trial took place in early November of 1919. When asked, Ernest pleaded not guilty. He said that he had killed the woman he loved, but he was not guilty of murder. It was stated that a doctor had assessed him and found him to be sane, but somewhat excitable and prone to drinking. He refused to be defended, and it seems he was clear in his desire to follow Rebecca in death. It was also said to be clear that Ernest had a deep, jealous feelings towards Rebecca, Although they had only been together for a short time, he loved her and felt that she had loved him. His thoughts of another man in her life do not seem to have been proven. It was stated that the message from Ernest concerning the daughter of Rebecca was simply made up. Her daughter had not been scalded and was perfectly fine. He had made this up as he knew that Rebecca, Rebecca loved her child and would go to see her straight away if she believed something to be wrong, which was exactly what he had wanted. It was said, however, that he would not have expected her to be travelling with Margaret Davison. He would have wanted her to be alone. This part of his plan had not worked as it was thought he planned to take his own life after taking Rebecca's and that nothing would be known about this until the letter was read by the Smith brothers. But of course, Margaret being at present at the time of the crime meant that this part of his plan was not going to work. Margaret Davison gave evidence similar to the story that I have already told, with the addition that she had seen the couple together the Saturday before the crime took place and said they appeared to be fine together and that Rebecca had also been in good spirits on the Sunday after that. Fred Robson's evidence about the razor was only to say that Ernest had given him no reason for his desire for the loan. It is to be guessed that Fred had no reason to suspect he wanted it for anything other than shaving purposes. Elijah Smith, one of the brothers who Rebecca kept house for, 
said he had indeed received the letter that was read out at the inquest. He had handed it to the police. No reason was given for Ernest writing to him and not to the parents of Rebecca. Several other people gave evidence as to what they had seen on the day. Most just described seeing the three walking together on the footpath or that they had heard Margaret's cries that Ernest had killed Rebecca but had not seen the actual crime take place. The trial was quite a short one. Ernest refused to ask any questions or to address the jury at the end of the trial. He just repeated, as he had done previously, I am guilty of taking her life, but it was anything but murder, but I took her life right enough. The judge, in summing up, said that Ernest admitted to killing Rebecca, but felt it was not worth murder. The law, however, saw this differently. It was indeed a murder unless there was a reasonable excuse, which in this case could not be found. It would seem that jealousy was the only motive behind the crime and that it was up to the jury to decide if this was murder or not, not the prisoner. The jury took only one minute to return a verdict of guilty of willful murder against Ernest Scott. As was unusual for the time, the jury did not recommend mercy for Ernest. When asked if he had anything to say as to why the sentence of death should not be passed upon him, he replied by saying, not in the least, I will get the happiness I want then. I have long looked for it. I was deprived of it. I will not be deprived of it in the next world. The judge then sentenced Ernest to death by hanging and that his remains would be buried within the walls of Newcastle Prison. Ernest replied by saying, I thank you. It is said that at this point a woman in the court screamed loudly and had to be helped outside. Ernest does not seem to have noticed this and was quietly removed from the dock and taken back to Newcastle Prison to await his fate. It is actually unclear as to whether or not a petition for reprieve was set up for Ernest. As he had no counsel, it would be left to friends or family to arrange. I have not been able to find any details of anything other than those for Ambrose Quinn and a low one newspaper mentioned that there would be no reprieve for either men. I didn't actually find anything in the name of Ernest alone. During his time in prison, Ernest was said often to be found singing loudly and he was always in good spirits. It was later said by Ernest himself that the reason he was singing was because the man in the cell next to him, this happened to be Ambrose Quinn, was always weeping and he sang to try and cheer the man up, but that it did not seem to be working. Ernest also wrote many letters. A lot of these were sent to his brothers and sisters and also his parents. I will not cover all of the details in every letter as there would be far too much, but there are a few little pieces that I will include which I think are interesting as they give a sort of insight into how Ernest was feeling. He seemed to be very concerned about Rebecca's daughter, often in his letters begging for the family, his family, to visit her and treat her well. I have read some of these letters and to me they seemed as though he felt the child was his, which of course she was not. He wanted his own brother to treat the child as his sister and visit her often. He also wrote to his family asking them to make sure that a good wreath was bought and placed on Rebecca's grave. And he even went as far as to write to Rebecca's family asking them to bring her daughter to visit him. I'm not sure why he would have wished this as the child would not have even known who he was. Rebecca's family did not wish to have anything to do with Ernest or his family and this caused him great upset. He had written to them to say that his people, meaning his family, were not responsible for his actions and that they were good people. This he also told to his sister, but Rebecca's family refused all of his letters and it is to be doubted that any of Ernest's family were ever allowed to visit Rebecca's daughter. In other letters he seemed oddly obsessed with the idea that Rebecca would be waiting for him on the other side that she would be pleased to see him and that they would be happy together. I found this idea very odd, why anyone would think someone who they had killed would be pleased to see them on the other side is beyond me. And just to mention one final letter, Ernest upset his mother by writing to her to say that the last thing he would be thinking of before he died was Rebecca's daughter. His mother was sad to hear this, expecting him to have been thinking of his own family. He, however, did not seem to understand this or see why 
what he had said had upset his mother so much. Ennis was also visited by several times by various family members and friends and it was said that at times he was quite well known for what was described as gallows humour, even once mentioning his new suit and discussing how low it was around the neck. He was mostly described as being cheerful and resigned to his fate, though it seems he could be described more as welcoming his fate. The night before the execution, Ernest is said to have slept well. He was up early in the morning and was said to be in good spirits. He ate a good breakfast and was then attended by the prison chaplain. It was said by one of the warders that he had never known a man to be so unconcerned at the punishment he was about to receive in all of his years of service of that as that of Ernest Scott. Just before 8am, Ernest was pinioned, which means his arms were tied at the wrists. It was said that he willingly gave his arms for this to be done. He then walked calmly and firmly towards the gallows, showing no signs of worry at what was about to happen to him. He was still of the firm belief that Rebecca would be waiting for him after his death. After being positioned on the drop, the sign was given to remove the bolt and Ernest fell. His death was said to be instantaneous. Outside of the prison, quite a large crowd had gathered to witness the event. They, of course, could see nothing, but would have been expecting the toll of the bell and the black flag to be flown to say that the punishment had been carried out, but neither of these signs were given and they saw nothing at all. It was said that at the same time as the execution, his grandmother, Ernest Scott's grandmother that is of course, who lived in Bedlington, had held a small service at her home. It was said that only a handful of neighbours and friends had attended the service. After the usual time of one hour, the body of Ernest was removed and was later buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison. His body would have been removed only a few minutes before the execution of Ambrose Quinn was to take place on the same spot. Just as a little extra piece of information, the executioner of Ernest Scott was John Ellis. Ellis was an executioner from 1901 until 1924. He resigned from the job, some say, after the difficult execution of Edith Thompson in 1923. However, he did continue working for some time after that execution. He had a reputation of being difficult to work with. At what point, one point it was said he almost came to blows with another executioner, but it was never said that he was not good at his job. He sadly took his own life in 1932 at the age of 57 after taking to heavy drinking. Rebecca Quinn paid the ultimate price of her life because of the jealousy of Ernest Scott and her daughter was left without a mother. Ernest, however, seems to have got exactly what he wanted. I have no details of what happened to Rebecca's daughter after her mother's death. I am sure that many of you have heard me mention the felon's plot in All Saints Cemetery in some of the previous stories I have covered. This was an unmarked mass grave where those buried within the grounds of Newcastle Prison were reburied when the prison was demolished in 1925. Ernest was one of the 11 whose body was found. Four bodies were never found and he was reburied in All Saints Cemetery. I hope you have found this somewhat sad and tragic story interesting. If you have enjoyed it, please do give it a thumbs up and please do consider subscribing to the channel if you'd like to hear more stories like this one. Thank you all very much for watching and I hope to see you again very soon.